Hi everyone, so this is going to be the enzymes lecture for AP Bio for this week. And again, we start with the big idea PowerPoint slides that have the AP language on here, which you can read through at your own time. So let's go ahead and start off with, in general, uh, all the proteins that we know of today, which we don't know all of them, but out of the ones that we have discovered so far, we have discovered that proteins usually work by binding to what's called a ligand. And I'm starting off with proteins in general just because enzymes are a type of protein. So again, proteins will bind to a ligand. And what is a ligand? Well, it comes from the Latin word ligare, which actually means to bind. And that makes sense because a ligand is a signaling molecule. And its function is to bind to um, a protein and then to incite some sort of reaction from there. So ligands can actually... Usually they're an ion or, or some other type of a small molecule, um, but they can actually bind to a protein either very tightly uh, or they can bind with a really weak interaction, so to speak, and it's, and it's more of a short-lived binding. But no matter whether it's tight or weak, all of the binding is very, very specific. So each protein can only bind to one or a few ligands and that's it and so each protein is um its, its function is very very specific so a ligand in general must fit precisely into the protein's binding site um, and so on this picture right here the yellow blob is our ligand and then the green is our protein and then here's your binding site and what it's showing you is that the the ligand has to fit precisely in the in the binding site of the protein. Otherwise, if it doesn't fit precisely, then we cannot form these non-covalent bonds, which are very important for the protein to actually um, follow through with its, its function. And these non-covalent bonds can be anything from hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, Van der Waals forces, all of that. Um, and oftentimes, an analogy that we use to describe the precise fit between the ligand and the binding site is saying that um, the ligand has to fit the binding site of the protein just like your hand has to fit inside of a glove. So an example of this um, is an antibody. So an antibody is a type of protein. We often call it an immunoglobulin, but it is a type of protein that is produced by our, omo our can't talk, by our own immune system in response to a foreign molecule such as a, a virus or a bacteria. And how do they work? So they will actually recognize the foreign molecule as foreign and they will recognize the um, antigen specifically on that foreign molecule and they will bind to that antigen. And the binding of this antibody to the antigen is very, very specific. In fact, um, antigens, the word antigen, typically uh, means antibody generator. Anti coming from antibody and then gen coming from generator. So it's an antibody generator. So our antibodies are actually generated specifically for these antigens. And so when they recognize the antigen and um, bind to them, they can actually do one or two things. They can either inactivate um, the, the foreign molecule altogether, or they can mark this foreign molecule for later destruction. So, but these antigen binding sites are, again, very, very specific. In fact, you know, even if you changed one amino acid, on the polypeptide chain, you could you could theoretically change the, the entire binding site. Um, but how they're formed, so this right here, this Y-shaped molecule, this is the actual antibody, okay, so it's the actual protein, and it's made up of four polypeptide chains. So two of those, we call them heavy chains, and two of them we call uh, light chains. And so the antigen binding site are these two yellow, they kind of look like little fingers at the ends of the, the y shape. And those are where the antigens actually bind. And so they're usually formed from different loops of polypeptide chains. And again, by changing one amino acid or even changing the lengths of the loops, you can change the, the binding site entirely. 
um, and then you can you can alter what type of an antigen the protein will actually bind to. So that's just an example of a protein because an antibody is not an enzyme, it's just a protein. Um, so it's an example of a protein binding to a ligand, like an antigen. So as we talk about proteins, um, we have a way to actually measure the binding strength of between a protein and its ligand. And we call that the equilibrium constant. And normally we will measure that as a K. And when we get further into the enzymes lecture, we'll, we'll refer back to this equilibrium constant as well. So the idea is that molecules in general in the cell will often encounter each other very frequently, not just proteins, but all molecules, um, because they're usually experiencing this random kind of thermal motion, so to speak. And so we can measure the strength with which any two of these molecules can bind to each other, and that's kind of what this diagram is showing you. We have molecule A that will randomly encounter with all of these other molecules, B, molecule C, and molecule D, okay? And so what it's telling you is that um, we have one molecule that can theoretically bind with all these other molecules. And so the surfaces of molecules A and B as well as the surfaces of molecules A and C are a poor match and are capable of forming only a few weak bonds. And so then their thermal motion will rapidly break them apart. Whereas over here, this is telling you that the surfaces of molecules A and D match really well and then therefore can form enough weak bonds to withstand um, the heat moving them around in different places. And so then therefore they will stay bound to each other. So really, this is telling you that molecule A has the capability of binding or coming into contact with um, these three different molecules. However, out of these three different molecules, um, molecule D is its most appropriate match. And so we have a way mathematically to actually measure the strength of that binding. And that's the whole idea behind the equilibrium constant. So, for example, we have a scenario here that I'm going to have you picture. Okay, so it says, picture this. Um, we have, and I'm going to go back to the antibodies, since we used the antibodies as an example earlier, of a protein binding to a ligand. So, let's say within your body, you have a lot of identical antibodies that will suddenly encounter a population of ligands diffusing into the fluid surrounding them. Okay, at frequent intervals, one of these ligand molecules will bump into the binding site of one of your antibodies, and then this will form an antibody ligand complex. Okay, so the population at this point of antibody ligand complexes will increase, and it will continue to increase. But that increase of antibody ligand complexes is limited. So over time, a second process where individual complexes break apart because of thermally induced motion will also become increasingly important. So eventually then, any population of antibody molecules and ligands will reach a, what we call a steady state or equilibrium. So in other words, at this steady state or at this state of equilibrium, we now have the number of binding events, or what we refer to as association events, per second is equal to the number of unbinding events, or what we refer to as dissociation events. Okay, so that's our scenario, right? So here we have the equilibrium constant again. Um, so back to our scenario. From the concentrations of the ligand, the antibody, and the antibody ligand complexes at equilibrium, we can calculate a convenient measure of the strength of the binding, and that's what we call the equilibrium constant in K. Those units are usually in liters per mole. So over here, we have the equilibrium binding equation. 
Um, and so AG is going to stand for the antigen or in our situation, the ligand. And then AB stands for the antibody. Okay, so ligand plus protein. And then K1, so the arrow in this direction, is going to be the association rate constant, right? So the rate at which the ligand and the protein bind to become the antigen antibody complex. And then it's a reversible reaction, so we can actually um, also take into account and measure the dissociation rate constant, which is K2. And so that's going to be um, the rate at which the antigen antibody complex dissociates into the ligand and the protein. So all in all, we have we can measure K, and I know this says KA because sometimes um, we can actually refer to it as just the association binding constant, because in this case, we're actually only referring to uh, one protein and one ligand. So it would be a, a single protein problem. But so we're referring to this one as K. And so this is going to be the equilibrium constant. So in order to find the equilibrium constant, um, we would divide uh, the dissociation rate constant by the association rate constant. And then therefore, um, we can find essentially, you know, how, what, what's the bond strength between the ligand and the protein. So um, the equilibrium constant is larger the greater the binding strength. Okay, so our, our K value will be a higher number. Um, the, 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 I'm sorry, our K value will be a higher number the larger that the, um, the, um, the larger the K value means that the greater the binding strength. And this is also a direct measure of the free energy difference between the bound and the free stakes, between the ligand and the protein. So uh, the last slide for this particular video, um, again, we talked about in general proteins, and now we're going to move on to specifically enzymes. So enzymes are highly, highly specific biological catalysts, and they are highly specific type of protein. Um, they're very specific because they bind to one or more ligands, and we call these ligands substrates. And then they convert these substrates into products. And they will do this over and over and over again, which means that they can be reused. Enzymes speed up reactions um, without being changed in the process. That's very important. And again, they act as catalysts that allow the cells to make or break covalent bonds in a very controlled way. The other cool thing about enzymes is that they work in teams oftentimes. So what that means is that the product from one reaction will ultimately be the substrate for the next reaction. And we'll go over a couple examples for that. And so this will, because enzymes work in teams, this often results in a very, what we call complex network of metabolic pathways that provide energy for the cell. So in other words, it allows life to be possible. And, um, those metabolic pathways that we will be referring to are cell respiration and photosynthesis.